Well, he is risen. My name is Nate. If we don't know each other, I would love to meet you. I'll be in the lobby after the service. But isn't it true that there are certain events in your life that have a way of correcting your course? Like because of what you experienced in this event, the way that you think is going to be different, the way that you live is going to be different. Maybe you've had a conversation like that before with somebody that you respect and it's like that was a defining moment for you. And from that moment forward, your course was corrected. Maybe that's how graduation was for you or will be for you. It'll be a wake-up call that you have to figure out what you're going to do with your life. Maybe that's how marriage was for you or having a kid. Maybe that's how buying a home was. Maybe that's how a near-death experience was for you. That It's like after that event, your course is going to be different. Your course is going to be corrected. Well, Easter is an event like that. The resurrection of Jesus is an event that changes the course. It, it course corrects our lives. It changes the way that we think and the way that we live. And so today, what I want to do is look at a passage of scripture, walk through it together, and then talk about the correction of the resurrection. The corrections of the resurrection. A lot of times we talk about the truthfulness of the resurrection. We talk about the evidences that there are for the resurrection. And there are lots of books written about that, and that's a very important subject. But today what we're talking about is the significance of the resurrection. Why does it matter that Jesus was raised from the dead? So Luke chapter 24 is where we'll be today if you have a Bible and want to follow along. Luke chapter 24. Let me catch you up to uh, the story that we're jumping in on. Jesus was crucified on Friday, and after he died, his followers scattered and started to hide. And the reason is because if they killed Jesus and we're associated with him, then will they come for us next? And so his followers are afraid, they start to hide, and then Saturday was the Sabbath. And for Jewish people, that meant they couldn't do anything, they couldn't go outside, and so they're cooped up. And then Sunday morning, a group of women make their way to the tomb in order to care for Jesus' dead body in the tomb. But when they get there, the stone has been rolled away and the tomb is empty, and so they freak out. And so they come back to the city of Jerusalem and they're looking for the apostles. They're looking for the people who they're going to be able to say, here's what we saw. The problem is everybody's scattered and so they can't find them. And so slowly they, they get word to Peter and John, two of Jesus' closest followers. And then Peter and John run to the tomb to look for themselves. And they see exactly what the women had said. Peter eventually encounters Jesus on his own. They come back to Jerusalem. They're trying to get word out to the other apostles that they should all come to this one house to meet. And then there are also these other disciples who were leaving the city of Jerusalem, going to this little village called Emmaus. And they encountered Jesus. And then they decided we should turn around and go back to the city and try to get word that we've seen Jesus. And so there are all of these different events happening where people are starting to see and experience the resurrected Jesus, but because they're all scattered, it's hard for them to get the news and for them to all get in a room together until Luke chapter 24, verse 36, and that's where we're picking up the story today. So they've just all gotten into the same room together so that they can start telling each other's stories and comparing the stories. And they're all confused. They're trying to talk over one another. And that's where we're picking up the story, Luke chapter 24, verse 36. As they were saying these things, he himself stood in their midst. That's Jesus. He said to them, peace to you, verse 37. But they were startled and terrified and thought they were seeing a ghost because they're going, We just saw you be killed. This is weird. What are you doing here? And so some of them think this is a ghost. And so they're freaked out. Verse 38. 
Why are you troubled, he asked them. And why do doubts arise in your hearts? In other words, why are you questioning what you see right now? Verse 39, look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. Jesus says, look, come touch me if you want. I'm real. Ghosts don't have flesh and bones, but here I am. Verse 40, having said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Now, this next verse is how I know that Jesus was a guy. Verse 41. But while they were still amazed and in disbelief because of their joy, he asked them, do you guys have anything here to eat? (laughs) It's like, I just rose from the dead. All right, I'm hungry. Got to eat. So do you guys have anything laying around here to eat? And then this next verse is how I know that nobody made up this story. Because if you were inventing a story many years after the fact, and you were trying to invent this myth that Jesus had rose from the dead, you would not think to include this detail. Here's what they say, verse 42. So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Oh yeah, how did they prepare the fish? It was broiled. Oh yeah, make sure, write that down. (laughs) And so as Jesus sits down and starts to eat this piece of broiled fish, He starts to talk to them, verse 44. He told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. He's saying, remember I told you that that this was gonna happen? Remember I said I was gonna die and be raised from the dead? And he says, The reason for that is everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be be fulfilled. And by saying the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, he's referencing the the traditional three-fold division of the Hebrew Bible, or what we call the Old Testament, what is still today called the Tanakh. This is the law of Moses, the prophets, the Psalms, or the writings. He's saying, all of it is about me. He also, then, verse 45, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. The resurrection is like a key that unlocks the Bible. It helps you see the meaning of the Old Testament. Verse 46, he also said to them, this is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day. And repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. And look, I am sending you what my father promised, referring to the Holy Spirit. As for you, stay in the city until you are empowered from on high. Jesus says, the Hebrew Bible The Old Testament, it was all about me and the repentance and forgiveness that I have come to bring. And you are gonna take the message about me and my death and my resurrection and the forgiveness that it offers the world. You're gonna take that to all the nations of the earth. But don't leave the city until the Holy Spirit comes. The man who wrote this, his name is Luke, he wrote a sequel to this book. This is the end. He wrote a sequel of this book, and it's in our New Testament. It's called the book of Acts, and he picks up the story in Acts chapter one, right there. But today, what I want to talk about is in light of this event, in light of this encounter that Jesus has, how does the resurrection correct our course? So, Here's what we're going to talk about. Seven corrections of the resurrection. Seven corrections of the resurrection. Here's number one. The body is not meaningless. The body is not 
meaningless. Sometimes we can pit the spiritual and the material or the physical against each other. One time I was in a small group uh, with this group of Christians and this guy said, my body is just a shell for my soul. My soul is what God really cares about. And there was a girl in the group who said, oh, I love the way you put that. And she wrote that down in her notebook. And so I thought, okay, how am I going to correct this delicately? Because that is not what the Bible teaches. That is not what the Christian faith teaches. We do not believe that God cares about the soul, but he doesn't care about the body. We do not believe that the spiritual world is more important than the physical world. Think about the story of the Bible for just a minute. In the beginning, when God creates the heavens and the earth, he creates the physical world. What does he call it? Good. He leads his people out of slavery in Egypt to take them to a land, a physical thing, with milk and honey is the way it's promoted to them. Jesus entered a womb. Luke goes out of his way in his gospel to tell us that Jesus grew in stature. Jesus fed people. Jesus healed people. And here, Luke is going out of his way to help us see that Jesus rose from the dead physically. The resurrection is not just a sentimental idea like, well, after winter, there's spring. And after death, there's life. And Jesus lives on. His spirit is still alive and active in his people here on earth. That is not the message of Luke 24. The message of Luke 24 is Jesus rose from the dead physically. You could see him, you could touch him. He even ate a piece of broiled fish. That's the message that Luke wants you to see. This was not some later invention after the idea of Jesus' teaching living on through the church. This is an event that happened. Jesus rose from the dead physically, and that has huge implications for the way that we do ministry as a church. This means that we care about meeting physical and spiritual needs. In James chapter 1, James was the brother of Jesus, And while Jesus was on earth, before he died on the cross, James did not follow Jesus. James thought Jesus was crazy. And then after the resurrection, James starts to follow Jesus, and he becomes a leader in the church. Let me ask you something. What would your brother have to do to convince you that he was the son of God? Right? James starts to follow Jesus. Jesus after the resurrection. And then he writes this letter to a group of early Christians. And here's what he says in James chapter one. He says, real religion, you wanna know what real religion looks like? And then he did not say, getting together for Bible studies. Is that important thing to do? Absolutely. But that's not what he said. He said, here's what real religion looks like. To care for widows and orphans, to meet physical needs. And then he goes on in chapter two to say, look, if somebody comes into your church and they're hungry and they haven't eaten, don't just pray for them that God would bless them and they would find food. Feed them, give them something to eat, care for their material needs. And so as Christians, we care about Spiritual needs, absolutely. But we also care for physical needs. And this also has huge implications for you personally. If you belong to Jesus, your future is not an ethereal existence where you'll float around in the clouds for all of eternity listening to worship music or something. If you belong to Jesus then your future is his future. His future is your future. What happened to Jesus after death? He was raised bodily 
from the dead. And if you belong to Jesus, that's also your hope. And here's why that's such good news for you. That means that your future, if you belong to Jesus, is a future with hugs and running and dancing and singing and cooking and climbing and swimming. Your future, if you belong to Jesus, is bodily. And for some of you, you already know what it's like for your body to begin to experience decay. You know what it's like to wake up and just your back hurts. You know what it's like to not be able to throw a ball like you used to without your shoulder being sore the next day. My grandmother, I think she's 85. She used to be one of my favorite cooks in the world. Now she doesn't get to cook anymore because she can't stand on her own in the kitchen long enough to cook. Do you know what the future is for her because she belongs to Jesus? Her future is a future in the kitchen if she wants it to be because there will be cooking. You'll be able to run again. You'll be able to dance again. You'll be able to sing again. Your mind will, will remember things like it used to again. That's your future if you belong to Jesus. The body is not meaningless. Jesus was raised from the dead physically. Here's number two. Jesus is not crazy. Jesus is not crazy. Now, Jesus did teach a lot of crazy stuff. Think about this. Jesus said, hey, listen, when it comes to money, don't be rich on earth. Be rich towards God. That's a direct quote. Don't store up for yourselves treasure on, hev- on earth. Store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. If you walked into your financial planner's office and you're like, listen, I really want to store up for myself treasure in heaven, all right? I, I just want to start, you know, being rich towards God. That sounds so stupid and crazy. Jesus taught that if somebody hits you in the face, you should turn and let them hit the other cheek as well. That sounds crazy. Jesus said, hey, you should follow me, speaking of himself. And then he said, and so deny yourself and what you want and take up your cross and and come with me. In other words, when your soul has a passion for certain things, when your heart is drawn towards certain things, Say no to that if it contradicts the invisible God and his will for your life. You should prioritize what the invisible God says to do rather than what your heart desires. That sounds crazy. And Jesus also taught his followers that he was going to die and be raised from the dead. He said that numerous times to his followers. But here's what's interesting. On Easter Sunday, there wasn't a group of people gathered outside the tomb counting down backwards from 10. Like, here we go, all right? 10, nine, you guys ready? He said, nobody's doing that. You know why? Because they thought he was crazy. After he died, it's over. He taught all these radical things. He talked a big game, but he died. That's it. unless the resurrection is true. If Jesus is raised from the dead, then everything he said must be taken seriously. If you can predict your own death and resurrection and then pull it off, then we've got to take what you have to say seriously. And so you can be rich towards God. You can store up treasure in heaven rather than on earth. Why? Because there's a resurrection There's a future for you that's beyond this world. You can turn the other cheek when you get slapped. Why? Because the honor and dignity that you ultimately long for is not to be had in this life. It's to be had in the future life, in the kingdom, in the resurrection. 
And you can be honored not in the eyes of the world, but in the eyes of the eternal, immortal, invisible God. And you can deny yourself even when it feels like death. Why? Because the dead are raised. There is joy after death. So you can say no to the things that your heart craves when they're contrary to the will of God because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Jesus is not crazy. And so the bottom line for you, if you're questioning Christianity, if you're curious but you're not convinced, the bottom line for you is did Jesus rise from the dead? Is the resurrection true? Because if it is, then everything else he said has to be taken seriously. But if it's not, the whole Bible can be thrown out. Jesus is not crazy because he was raised from the dead. Number three, the Bible is not random. The Bible is not random. I grew up thinking that the Bible was a long, confusing book with a bunch of random people and places and stories and sayings and commands and rules. And the resurrection of Jesus says that that actually the Bible is not random. The Bible is a unified collection of writings telling a story about a savior named Jesus. This is why Jesus says, In verse 44, aren't these my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you? Everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, the Old Testament must be fulfilled. Then he opened their mind to understand the scriptures. He said to them, this is what is written. And then he doesn't quote a verse. He says, this is what is written. And then he summarizes the whole thing. This is what is written. The Messiah would suffer and rise from the dead the third day and repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name. That's the point. And so here's why this matters for you. The reason that we study the Bible, the reason that you should read the Bible is to get to know God and grow in your love for him by learning more about his son, Jesus. That's the point of Bible study. That's the point of Bible preaching. The point of Bible study is not to figure out who the Antichrist is. The the point of Bible study is not to have a Bible verse to tack along to your right-wing conspiracy theory on Instagram. The point of Bible study is not just to find helpful principles to make your life better, even though the Bible is full of those. The point of reading and studying the Bible is to help you know and love God better through his son, Jesus. That's the point. And so we take the Bible seriously only because Jesus was raised from the dead and the story is about him. This is why Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter three, talking to Timothy, this young guy, he says, you've known the Bible since you were a kid talking about the Old Testament. And then he says, which is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. He says that about the Old Testament. That's the point of scripture. We're gonna talk more about that next Sunday when we start our new series called Built to Last. Number four, failure is not final. Failure is not final. Some of you feel like your failure will always define you. You've embarrassed yourself. You've hurt someone that you love. You've disappointed someone. You've made such a mess of your life. The resurrection of Jesus says that your story is not over. The resurrection of Jesus says that repentance, that means change, 
and forgiveness of sins is possible for you. Look at what he says in verse 47. Jesus says, in repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name. See, the reason your story might feel like it's over, the reason that failure might feel final to you is because if it's only up to you and your name, maybe that's true. The hope for failures is that there is forgiveness in his name, in the name of Jesus. Jesus went to the cross and died in the place of sinners, the righteous for the unrighteous. Jesus was raised from the dead so that your story can be redeemed. See, you do not have to crucify yourself for your failures Because there is a savior who's been crucified for you. His name is Jesus and he has been raised from the dead. We tend to think that the only solution for all of the mess that we've made is like a time machine so that we can go back in time and change things. We think that our story needs to be able to be redacted so that we can edit how things have gone. The message of Jesus is that your story cannot be redacted, but it can be forgiven. And it's forgiven in his name. So the question for you, if you are overcome today with the weight of your sin, the question for you is, will you come to Jesus? Will you come to the Savior who died for sinners and who was raised for sinners? And in order to do that, you're going to have to repent, it says. To repent just means to change your mind about stuff. So you're going to have to stop thinking that you're smart and that your way is better, and you're going to have to change and say, God, I've rebelled against you. I'm guilty. For some of you, you've gotten so good at pretending that that's going to mean that you're going to have to come out of the dark and confess You're going to have to come into the light and have your sin exposed. And that might feel like death to you. And that's why the good news for you is that you have a Savior who raises the dead. So come to Jesus. Come into the light. Change your thinking about how you've been living and trust in Jesus. Believe in his name, the name who forgives sinners. Number five, the invitation is not exclusive. The invitation is not exclusive. There is a lie currently creeping into our culture that Christianity is a white Republican thing. And it is not true. Luke 2447 says that this repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning at Jerusalem. The origins of this are not white and American and Republican and Western. The origins of these things are in Jerusalem. And when it says nations there, it's not talking about political groups. It's talking about people groups. And this has always been God's vision to bring all peoples together under one name, the name of Jesus. This is why in Genesis chapter 12, he comes to Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation that will eventually be capitaled in Jerusalem. He comes to Abraham and he says, I'm not just gonna bless you and your family. I'm gonna bless all the families of the earth through you. This is why when God leads the nation of Israel out of slavery in Egypt, it says, in Exodus, that there's a mixed multitude that comes with them. That means there were people who were not Israelites, not Jewish, who trusted in God and were saved. This has always been God's vision. This is why Rahab and Ruth, two Gentile, non-Jewish women, are included in God's story and become part of Jesus's family line. This is why the book of Jonah 
is in your Bible. Did you know the, the book of Jonah is not primarily about how a man got swallowed by a fish? The book of Jonah is primarily about how God loves people that you might hate. And so he sends Jonah, this Jewish prophet, to the nation of Assyria, the capital city, to proclaim repentance there. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 10, I'm the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep, but we've got some sheep who are not part of this fold. Speaking of non-Jewish people, and we gotta bring them also. This is why the great commission is to go into all nations, to go to all the peoples of the earth. This has always been God's vision. And this has many important implications for us as a church. This means that Racism is evil and absolutely incompatible with the Christian faith. The church has not always gotten this right in America, and this has to be acknowledged and repented of. As a white pastor, there are things that I could do that I'm even unaware of that would be microaggressions to people who are different than me. And as a pastor, I should be sensitive to that and I should care about that. I shouldn't just ignore that because the message of Jesus and his death and resurrection is for all people. This also means that discrimination and favoritism based on any cultural line must be strongly rejected in the church. If you're wealthy or if you're poor, your value is the same in this place. If you're a man or a woman, your value is the same in this place. If you're young or old, your value is the same in this place. If you're cool or uncool, and that might be the most difficult one in our culture, you are still welcome in this place. And this has many important implications for you too. This means that no matter your background, Jesus says, I came for you. And so we don't just say, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We say, Christos a aviat. Did I say that right? you're invited to the life everlasting that Jesus offers because he was crucified and he was raised. Number six, the mission is not over. Jesus says, you're gonna go into all nations. You're gonna proclaim this message about my death and resurrection to all nations. You are witnesses of these things. So wait for the Holy Spirit to empower you. And that mission is not over. And we have the spirit of God in us and among us today. And we are invited by Jesus. We are called by Jesus to participate in this mission of taking the gospel to all the peoples of the earth. So we have work to do. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you are called to serve this mission. And my hope for our church is that we would be a church who is always driven by this mission to help people of all backgrounds and nations come to faith in Jesus. And so my hope for our church is that we would be a church where when we gather together on Sundays, the good news of Jesus and his death and resurrection is always preached. That we would be a place that when we gather to sing, that we would sing loudly and passionately because we so cherish what God has done for us by sending his son, Jesus. That we, we would be a place that is full of loving community, so committed to one another and caring for one another, that we become compelling to the outside world. That the culture in here would bubble up with love and ooze out into our community, that we would be a church that creatively and patiently passes on the faith to the next generation of kids and students, that we would be a church that is known for being kind to our community, 
that's known for being the most caring group of people in our community. So that even people who, who don't believe like us or don't think like us would be glad that we're here because of the good that we do. That we would be a place who also prays for and gives to and sends missionaries around the world to see more and more tribes and tongues come to worship Jesus. And the reason that this mission exists, the reason that it's worth giving your life to is because Jesus was raised from the dead. And number seven, hope is not lost. I don't know what the burden is that you came in here with today. Maybe there's a loved one who is wandering and you don't know that that You don't know what's gonna happen. And it feels like talking to them about Jesus would be like trying to have a conversation with a dead person. They're so disengaged. And the message of Jesus is that God raises the dead. So hope is not lost. I don't know if there's a health crisis or a financial trouble. I don't know if you're single and you wanna be married I don't know if you're in a marriage that is not as great as maybe other marriages that you hear about. I don't know if you're wanting to have children and you've not been able to. I don't know what the dream is that's going unfulfilled in your life. I don't know what the challenge is. But if you belong to Jesus, I know that your future is secure. The fears you have, the pain you feel, these are all temporary. The dreams you've missed and the memories you've lost, these joys are not irretrievable. There is a greater joy to be had. And because of the resurrection, you will get to experience it. And so when Jesus returns and you are raised from the dead, what joy will you have missed out on? Absolutely nothing. Because hope is not lost. I don't know what you need to do in light of the resurrection, but I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit to help you do it. Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you that he went to the cross to die in the place of sinners. Thank you for raising him from the dead so that repentance and forgiveness of sins is possible for all nations. God, in light of what we heard today, would your spirit be active? Would you give us wisdom to know what to do with what we've heard and then the courage to do it? It's in Jesus' name that I ask, amen. Would you stand with us?